let's get started, please. Uh, unfortunately, I'm a little bit sick, so I'll do my best. But uh, I may be a little lower on the energy levels than usual. So today we're going to talk about sparse matrix factorization. So we'll be continuing with the theme of PCA and matrix factorization. Uh, as far as admin is concerned, there's an assignment out that's due on Friday next week, and that's about it. So last time we talked about PCA having all kinds of problems, um, and the, in particular cases where the solution was not unique, and that you might get strange solutions. So we talked about the scaling problem. It's just W times Z. So if I make W a 1,000 times bigger and Z a 1,000 times smaller or the other way around, everything's fine. Uh, and with more dimensions, we had all kinds of other things you could do to W and Z without actually changing the subspace that you were learning. So we fix those. Uh, for each problem, we kind of introduce the solution. So we have our W being an orthogonal matrix, meaning the basis vectors excuse me, are orthonormal. And we also talked about getting these principal components in order. So the first row of W explains the most variance, then the second row of W, and so on. In other words, if that first row was the only one, if k was equal to 1, that would be the solution. And then if we had k equals 2, then we would add that on, and so on and so forth. So we'll talk about a few applications today of these matrix factorization models. And one of them is um, phase detection. And uh, there's this, these basis, basis vectors called these eigenfaces that we're going to talk about. If you're seeing the word eigen and wondering about that, another way to compute PCA other than doing the SVD on x is to compute the eigenvalue decomposition on x transpose x. So this is related to eigenvalue decomposition, but not of x, but of this related square matrix. So there's a lot of linear algebra connections going on here. So here's a data set of faces. And they're just grayscale images. And we're going to flatten each image to be one training example. So um, a particular column of an image is just the first bunch of features, and then the next column is the next bunch of features, and so on. So each image is getting flattened out into a vector. It's one training example, and therefore it's a row of x. <coughs> So we, we're going to have to be careful for the next few minutes about this flattening and just getting our orientation straight. So um, the fact that I'm showing this to you in a grid also has no meaning. I'm just showing you this in a grid because that's kind of the shape of a slide. So when I'm trying to show you 100 faces or however many are here, it's just easier to put them in a grid so that they fit. But really, you should be thinking about these as each face is in a line, and also each one is flattened out this way. Okay, so no significance to the fact that there's a, a grid here. And then what we say, okay, what if we run PCA on this data set? Well, what happens? The first thing we need to do to run PCA is compute the mean. The way you should be thinking about this is that each chain example is a face, it's a flattened vector. The mean is also a vector of length d, where d is the number of pixels in an image. And then we're just unflattening it. Oh, does it look like a face from where you're sitting? <laughs> it does from, from here, for me. It looks a little better. How about the people in the back? <laughs> okay, so the farther back you are, maybe the better this is. If you're too close to the front and you have your laptop, you might want to follow along. Um, with the slides that are posted. So the first thing you want to do is take the average, and this is 
not the average face, but the average face for the particular data set that we're considering. And then we're going to center all of our examples, just like we always do for PCA, we'll subtract the mean. And then we can run PCA. Now this thing here is W, and I just want to explain how it's being shown to you. Each row of W is a basis vector, which is a vector of length D. That's exactly what's happening here. We're taking each row of W that's a vector of length D, and then we're unflattening it back into an image again so we can look at it. And that's the top one there in the top left. And then as you go along, those are the different rows of W. Again, the fact that they, there is a grid here is just so that they can fit on the slide, but there's no significance to it being a grid. So don't, you, don't, you shouldn't be thinking, this is a square looking thing and W is a square looking thing and they're the same, so that's not right. Each square face in this grid here is a row of W. That's kind of interesting. The really nice thing about working with images is you can actually look at your basis vectors. And we'll come back to that in a few weeks when we talk about neural networks. But normally, it's just a bunch of numbers in W and I don't know what. You can look at it, but it won't have meaning in the same way as when we look at the. So these are actually quite interesting to look at um, to try to understand. The first few are kind of interpretable in a way that the later ones just look like a big mess, at least to me. Um, but we'll talk now about the interpretations of these things. OK, we talked about this. Right, so remember the entries in W can be positive or negative. So the way this visualization is working is that gray is 0, dark is negative, and bright is positive. So any questions about the format of what I'm showing you? Because we're going to now dig into this a bunch. You said a row is D dimensions for the... the, the well, W, our K W matrix is K by D. It's just our basis vectors stacked on top of each other. Each one is a row. So these faces are the basis vectors, because the space we're in, the d-dimensional space we're in, is actually image space, because you can vary all the pixels. So if these are 10 by 10 images, we're in a 100-dimensional space, but each point in that space is an image. These are basis vectors in image space, and we're now allowed to take linear combinations of these basis vectors to try to reconstruct faces. Any other questions? We're going to be doing at least five more minutes on these faces, so if you're lost, it would be good to speak up. All right. So in this case, is k equal to n? Yeah, right. In this case, it's k equal to d, I guess. Is what, uh, or it's k equal to n. Um, no. Um, so remember, the, the full thing is when k equals d. Right. That's like when you're the full <laughs> basis. Um, the thing is, when we talked last time about the SVD, is that you can just compute it for some large k, and then if you want to know what the solution would have been for k equals 1, you can just take the first one. You don't have to start again. So think of this as however many things are here, I don't know, 100. These are like running the SVD, and then I'm showing you the first 100. But if I want to know what would have happened if I set k equals 2, it's just taking those first two. Sorry, so that first phase we see is the one that explains the most variance? Correct. The first phase we see is the one that explains the most variance. And I want to dig into that now to try to build some intuition about what that really means. OK, so again, we're reconstructing our x hat. Our reconstructed x is the mean plus the linear combination of our basis vectors. These squares here, these faces, are our basis vectors. They're rows of w, and we're taking a z vector and 
multiplying it by that parameter. Uh, if there is a noise, uh, the image is supposed to Much be louder. Other, uh, Three times louder. Okay. If the image containing noise, uh, I'm expecting the PCA to eliminate the noise into one of the components, or it might be correlated somehow. How do we deal with noise? Yeah. So. These principal components give us the direction of most variation or most variance or, or whatever you want to call it. So um, if the noise is kind of, I guess, random or different for all of the images, then we'll probably end up explaining it with the much later components, which we don't really have meaning for anymore, but they're just the right things that add up in the right way to explain the noise. Um, as I mentioned last time, what if there's, a, there's this issue of a lot of noise and you can use the L1 loss instead of L2, which is what you do on the assignment. Okay. So here's a bunch of the original faces. I see why Connor asked about k equals n. It's just, I'm showing you 100 faces and then I'm showing you 100 principal components, but the data set actually has more than 100. It's just what I'm showing you. Yeah. Okay. So let's, for each of these 100 faces, try to reconstruct them for a particular k. Starting with k equals 0. k equals 0 means I just have the mean and I don't have any principal components in play. So this is our reconstruction. When, with k equals 0, we have nothing. Like we have no z, we have no w. It's just my best reconstruction of every face is the average face. And now let's crank it up to k equals 1. So here on the bottom in red, we're highlighting like how many of the terms we're keeping in this approximation. OK, when we move up to k equals 1, that means, remember, this is all about the span. When we're in the span of a one-dimensional space here. We're along a line in image space. And the z value tells us where we are along the line. And each image has its own z. And for each one, you're looking at the reconstruction, which is the point on that line that is closest to the original image. So it's kind of like an overall intensity type thing, but kind of a little face-like. So you can see some very bright uh, images and some very dark images. I mean, if it was really overall intensity, the principal component would just be all ones. Um, but it's something sort of like that. And we're going to talk about this much more, but any questions about what the picture is showing? Well, we do explain the variance. Oh, the variance, right. So the variance explained, as we talked about at the end of last class, is basically just the loss, but normalized to be between 0 and 1, and then flipped like 1 minus it so that more is better, whereas with the loss, lower is better. So variance explained up to 100%. Um, means we've perfectly reconstructed everything. So we're just basically keeping track of how much does our score go up as we increase k. Okay. That's good enough. Okay. So this is very nice. I, I, I mentioned it is along a line. So we can actually look at that line, visualize it, and we can take some representative points along the line. And we can see that this principal component is doing something related to overall intensity. So if I take a point with a very positive z value, it's very bright. And with a very negative z value, it's very dark. So it's kind of like we're restricting ourselves to roughly to the average face plus or minus changing the overall intensity. And that's the one dimension that we've decided to live on, if we could only live on one dimension. So the y-axis is just meaningless in this picture. There's only one, one axis, because k equals 1. OK, what about k equals 2? We bring in the next PC. This is my favorite part. Because looking at this thing, we can immediately see what it does. It's bright on the right and dark on the left. So this principal component, this basis vector, allows us, gives us a new direction to move in, which is a relative intensity direction. And if we add a lot of that thing, 
we'll get an image that's much brighter on the right. And if we subtract a lot of that thing, we'll get an image that's much brighter on the left. And so now that we're allowed to vary in that dimension, look at the reconstructions. Not all of them have this property, so this one at the top is still kind of uniform brightness. That just means the original image had uniform brightness, so I don't need to use any of that direction for that particular face. That's fine. But for many of them, I do need to do that. And again, with some positive and with some negative. So I like this a lot because it's, we can kind of interpret what these basis vectors or principal components are actually doing. Maybe I can't interpret PC number 50, but with these ones we can start to feel what it's actually doing. And now we have two dimensions. So if we wanted to plot our faces at a scatter plot in two dimensions, this is what it would look like. And if you look at some representative images, well it's not that surprising. We have that old dimension, and we have this new dimension. So I've mapped my image down to 2D space, which is roughly just overall intensity and left-right brightness, and then I add that change onto the average face, and that's my reconstruction. And now you can see that the more, the larger K is, the better we'll be able to get to the original thing. And this is amazing because it just automatically finds us these best directions using some linear algebra in a totally unsupervised way. So, oh, yeah, Oliver. Um, so as we keep adding principal components, should the variance explain, the increase in variance explain, keep going down as we move along? Yeah, you would sort of expect that. The question was, the, 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 the marginal increase in variance explained, do we expect that to be going down, right? And yeah, we kind of do. I kind of expect it to look sort of like, this, where this is k, and this is variance explained. Yeah, I agree. <coughs> and then I expect it to kind of asymptote off that one. Just because like the first principal component explained 34% variance, and then adding the second one added, I think, 37 more percent, so that's uh, actually a bigger jump. Oh, that's a little worrying. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of worried about that too. Oliver is worried because the second one seemed to explain more variance than the first one. Well, maybe that's 71, 34, fair enough. Okay, I'll have to look into that and get back to you. It looks to me like it's a mistake because the definition of the first principal component is the one that explains the most variance. Um, yeah, I was thinking of putting this onto a Jupyter notebook, but then I got sick, so uh, I'll, I'll try to take a look after class. Okay. So we can have a, add a third principal component. Now we're in a 3D space. These are reconstructions, and so on and so forth. So by the time you get to k equals 5, we're already doing a pretty good job. Our reconstruction error is already pretty low. So again, this is again showing the principal components. This is again showing the examples. Again, there's no significance to the fact that they're in a grid. These, there's also no order to them. These, there is an order to them, starting from top left and going across. So as you keep increasing k, you'll get closer and closer, and by the time we have, how far is this going to go? 50-ish, and we have like 5% error, we could say. Um, so we're doing a pretty good job, I mean these already look plausible, they look like faces, even though the original thing, well I don't remember what the sizes of the images are, but well, they're definitely looks like a couple hundred pixels, at least, each. Um, but now with only 50 basis vectors, we're representing them. And so if we did set k equal to n, 
would we be able to perfectly recreate the original data? If sentence? we set k equal to d, d, we would be able to perfectly reconstruct the original data set. And again, the intuition is I'm in a d dimensional space. I need d basis vectors to form the full basis and be able to scan the whole space. Okay. Another way of thinking about it if k equals to d, then x is n by d. Z is n by d, is d by d. Okay. Do you generally choose k with respect to the variance? Yeah, so the variance, again, it's the same thing as the loss. So choosing it k based on this or choosing k based on the loss is just going to be the exact same picture, but going down instead of up and, and scale. Um, but yeah, as, as with k means, if you only pick based on this, you'll just get the biggest possible k, so you have to do a kind of eyeballing or something fancier, which we don't cover anything fancy. Gary? Is it correct to say that um, it to perfectly represent all the images, say, um, k must be the minimum of d and n? Because if you have le if you have... Yeah, okay, you're saying what if n is less than d? Yeah, maybe, maybe that's true, yeah. Um, that sounds possible. Okay. Okay, well now, now we know how big the images are there. Uh, 32 by 32. Okay, so that's all just fun stuff relating to things we've already talked about, but let's get on to the new stuff. So, now that we have this nice face thing, we can again reinterpret vector quantization with k-means as we have these w's, and we're just taking one of them and zero of all the rest. So, represent a face by an average face in the cluster. And people in the cluster all just get the same representation. We can think about PCA as a global average plus a linear combination of some number of factors, principal components, basis vectors. By the way, can people in the back hear me? Okay, I'm just sucking a little quieter because I'm a bit sick. Um, but you might not have thought those PCs looked that great. I mean, I was, I was talking about the first couple of them, but then as you probably saw, they started getting a little crazy and a little weird. Um, and yeah, they were basically just the mathematical thing that they had to be. There was a lot that they had to be. They had to be orthogonal to all the previous ones and be the next best thing that minimizes the loss. So they just started looking weird. So today, the main algorithm we're going to talk about is non-negative matrix factorization, or NMF. And the constraints we're going to impose is still going to be x approximately equal to z times w. But the constraint, instead of ortho orthogonal w, is going to be the elements of w and z need to be non-negative. And we're going to see that there's a very interesting mathematical consequence of this simple sounding assumption, which is that you tend to get these parts-based representations, where you might have five different noses, five different eyes, etc., etc., and you're just going to pick, I want a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of that, and uh, we're going to dig into the math of why that ends up happening. So we won't get all the weird cancellation of stuff, because we cannot have cancellation if we don't allow negative numbers. You're only adding a positive number times positive, or non negative number times non negative stuff, more non negative number times more non negative stuff. So you just keep building and building, but you can't take something away once you've added it in. And another thing we'll talk about today is notice a lot of these numbers are zero. We'll talk about why that is. And it's a kind of a flashback to L1 regularization where we got actual zeros, not just near zeros. We're going to get actual zeros again today. <coughs> I thought I took out most of 
most of the neuroscience stuff and put it into the end, but I guess I left the word neurons in one place. Um, I'll get to that later if we have time. Okay, so warm up. Good old least squares, your favorite thing. What happens if we do good old least squares, but we say, let's impose a non-negativity constraint. So let's assume our data set is all non-negative. But we're also going to demand that W be negative. What are the implications of this demand? Well, again, as always, for this intuition, we go back to the one-dimensional case so we can plot things. One feature, one W, forget the intercept. Then we can plot the loss versus W, which would normally be a d-dimensional plot, which we can't look at, but we can look at it now. And it's, it's quadratic. It's a parabola. This is not, well, yes, we've talked plenty about how this is a quadratic function of W. And let's say the minimum was here. It doesn't matter. Some arbitrary place on the board. That's the best W. That's the thing I'm going to find. And then I add non-negativity constraints. But the best W was already positive, whether it was 3 or 5 or 100 or whatever. If it was going to be positive anyway, and then I said, by the way, you can't be negative, that constraint doesn't do anything. It's not an active constraint. Here's what I would like to do. I'd like it to be 5. Oh, by the way, you have to be greater than or equal to 0. Fine. I already am, right? So it doesn't change the solution to add that constraint if the solution was already conforming to that constraint. So, non-negative least square solution is the same as the least square solution. But what about the other case? The other case is I would have liked to have w equals negative 1 or whatever, some negative number. But you say, OK, by the way, you can't do that. And I'll say, OK, I'm going to do the next best thing. And this is a parabola, all right? It's this monotonic, nice looking function. I'm just going to go to 0 because it's just if 0 is worse than where I am now, then past 0 is going to be even worse. And that's what the picture is showing. So if the solution would have been negative, my constrained optimum, the minimizer of the constrained optimization problem, is w equals 0. And this is basically it. That's basically the idea why you get true zeros. And I actually think this is much easier to understand than the L1 regularization thing. To understand why L1 regularization gives you zeros is quite a sophisticated exercise to go through that. But here I find, um, at least for me, it's easier to relate to this. Questions about this? Okay, so what, um, yeah, okay, so like L1 regularization, non-negativity constraints lead to sparsity. Um, and this is kind of a more advanced point, but it also regularizes, and we'll talk a bit more about that uh, next week or the week after as well. So here's what I don't want you to do. Um, I don't want you to say, oh, I know how to solve all these problems now. I'm just going to solve it. And then everything that was negative, I'll just set it to zero. Because that worked in the picture I showed you, right? And that works in one dimension, but it doesn't work in higher dimensions. So um, this backslash is just leftover MATLAB notation. You can just think of that as an inverse. That's fine. Um, we don't want to do that. So. It's like if you had two W's and one was supposed to be 10 and one was supposed to be minus 10, and they're for collinear features just as a way of making the point, then I can't just set the negative 10, 1 to 0. That messes everything up, right? Um, <coughs> so we have to be careful. We, we can optimize this thing, but not in such a naive way. OK, so eight. An approach that actually works is called projected gradient. And we do gra our gradient descent step. And then at each step, we deal with the negative values. 
So this t plus half notation is just saying our iteration actually has two steps to it. The, the update w normal gradient descent thing and then the make negative stuff zero thing. So uh, we still call that one iteration, but that's why it says t plus half, just to say I'm part of the way there, but I also have to do this other thing. So I'm not going to prove to you that this works, but it works, and so that means we can actually deal with this non-negative matrix vectorization problem. We can basically just do this. Okay, um, and so if you're wondering about this find min L1 that was in your assignment, um, as I was mentioning, there's kind of a relationship between L1 regularization and non-negativity. So the thing you were given in your assignment to solve the lasso problem <coughs> was um, uses a flavor of this. Okay. So we can go through all the stuff we did last time about different ways of doing this. Um, so we can do this alternating thing like we talked about last time, or we can just do our projected gradient, um, or we can even do stochastic projected gradient. I don't really want to dwell on this because there's other stuff I want to talk about, but essentially the things we talked about last time we can do here as well, just with this extra step at every iteration. Okay. Um, right. So the, a difference between this and PCA is, I said with PCA you could do different initializations, you pretty much get a solution every time, so that's not quite true here. Um, but you can still use random initialization. Okay. This I really like. This is an application that's actually work done by a fellow student of mine in my group in grad school, working on sports analytics. And they use non-negative matrix vectorization on basketball shots. And I don't pay any attention to basketball or know anything about basketball, but I still think this is really cool. So <laughs> check it out. Um, they're recording where players take shots. And they essentially use non-negative NMF, non-negative matrix vectorization, on the shot locations. Um, the fanciness here is that they're also incorporating the spatialness in a way that is beyond what we talk about in the course. They're not just thinking of each shot as like an independent training example in 2D. So a fancier version of what we talked about. And then these things up here, these little pictures, are the principal components or factors or whatever you want to call them. So in order to explain, each training example is, is a player. And you can think of the shots as kind of like the features. And I want to reconstruct the behavior of an individual player. So like one of those two things at the top. I'd like to reconstruct those maps, like the ones at the top. And I can use these basis vectors. So I can say each player is some combination of this behavior. I don't know what that is. Right-handed layup, left-handed layup, shoots, whatever, this side. <laughs> I don't know. You probably know better than me, right? But like three pointers, two pointers. But this is amazing because this is all just pulled out of this big data set in an unsupervised way. And for someone who knows more than I do about basketball, but even from my perspective, it looks like it's actually learning stuff about people's behavior. And just by looking at these coefficients now for a player, you can say, well, pretty much the only basketball player I've heard of is Steph Curry. And I know he takes a lot of three-pointers. And you can really see that. You can say, oh, look, there's a lot of this component and a lot of that component. And probably just by looking at this, you can figure out if the person's left-handed or right-handed or all kinds of other things. So um, sports teams are very interested in this kind of thing. And I think it was the LA Kings um, a year ago or so hired Luke Bourne, who was at SFU, but also worked on this. So it's, it's really neat to just see in a completely unsupervised way, here's all these shots these different players are taking. 
bam. And we want not negative, right? We don't really want to say a player is like negative left-handed layup. That doesn't really make sense, right? And we don't want to say that a, a particular basis vector is like I take negative shots from here. That doesn't also really make sense, right? So this additivity, both in the basis vectors, those pictures, those are the Ws, and this thing here, this is the Zs, right? Non-negativity kind of makes sense, and it's really amazing how much stuff you can just pull out in an in unsupervised way. Any questions on this that I have the chance of being able to answer? At least any, are you, I would like you to understand, looking at this, what is W, what is Z, what am I looking at? Um, so W is the top one, and then the, are Z the little the numbers for each player? Yeah, so remember, Z is an N by D matrix. So you have a Z vector per player. So one of these rows is a Z vector. And this whole table here is the Z matrix. Probably not the full Z matrix. They probably have more players than this, but it's a piece of the Z matrix. And these are like the new dimensions that I've learned. I don't know how many there are here, eight or whatever. Those are the eight dimensions um, that I've learned. So another application I want to talk about is topic modeling. So this is a popular thing in natural language processing and dealing with documents and text and all that, which we don't really touch on in the course, but I know that's a lot of text. Um, let, me, let me try to talk about it. So you have a whole bunch of documents. You have a whole bunch of words. Use bag of words features, which we talked about before. So every document gets a feature vector saying, which words are in it, or how many times does each word occur um, in it. And then you want to automatically, in an unsupervised way, learn topics. So for me, I think this is a very clear example of where NMF makes more sense than PCA. So we're going to get an N by K Z matrix that says for each document, here I've learned K topics. Here are the topics that that document is participating in, and I'm going to learn a K by D matrix W that says for each of the K topics, what direction are they in, meaning what words contribute to that topic. And it's, again, totally unsupervised. But non-negativity really makes sense here. It just wouldn't make sense to say a top, this economics topic involves the word finance and the word business and negative 72 of the word birthday or whatever. It's just, it's just weird, right? So it's more interpretable and intuitive if um, we have this non-negativity. And the non-negativity in the other matrix makes sense, because it makes sense to say that a particular document is part of these topics. And not, it's weird to say it's negatively part of that topic. And the sparsity is very natural, because it's really, really nice to say if every single topic had an entry for every single word, it's, it's like, that's not really the way it works, right? A topic, probably, there's like some number of keywords that matter, and the rest you can ignore. And same for a document. It's weird to say this document is a linear combination of every single topic, some positive, some negative, whatever. Actually, you just want two or three topics that a document came from. And so all the non-negativity and all the sparsity is applicable here, and so NMF is a much more sensible approach than PCA. And NMF isn't necessarily the dominant approach to topic modeling. There's something called latent Dirichlet allocation, LDA, that's uh, probably more popular, but we don't cover it in this course. But even so, I just want to show you this is like, this is actually good for something, right? There are situations where the non-negativity is natural and the sparsity is also appealing. Okay, so another thing we can do um, is we can have, instead of adding constraints like we were doing today, non-negativity constraints, we can add regularization to PCA. So we can minimize this. And 
when we do this, we're not doing the SVD anymore that gives us all these nice orthonormal, etc., etc. We're just saying, here's some function. I'm just going to minimize it because I know how to minimize things. So I'm departing from the nice. And I talked about that a bit last time. You depart from the particular case where the perfect thing works out. It's nice to be able to make changes, but you can't use those fancy fitting methods anymore. So uh, there's just a slight kind of twist here. Uh, it's not that fundamental of a point, but it's worth saying that if you do this and you only regularize W or only <coughs> regularize Z, that doesn't work because say I only regularize W, okay, that's fine. W has to be small, fine. I'll make W insanely small and Z insanely big, or vice versa. So it's kind of like W and Z are both pushing on this thing, and you've got to push them both at the same time by regularizing both. Otherwise, you don't actually solve the scaling problem that we talked about last time, which is that I can make one big and the other small. And because we can do L2 regularization, we can also do L1 regularization if we wanted to. That's the beauty of this thing. Once we get sort of a bag of tricks, we can start mixing and matching out oh, this model, this regularization. I mean, we were talking a completely different universe when we introduced L1 regularization, which was supervised learning, right? Now this is unsupervised learning, and yet all of our intuition comes with us, which is really nice. And we just need to be a little savvy in how to optimize things because sometimes when I make a certain change there's implications in what type of optimization method I can use but other than that um, these things pretty much work so now we have a whole family of tools you know PCA, the, or the regular one that's orthogonal the re regularized one, L2, L1 L1 on W and L2 on Z, vice versa not negative. So we have a whole bunch of stuff, and I guess it, it, it just depends what you're doing. I guess that's the best thing I can say. And um, is your data set non negative? Does it make sense for your factors and your sets to be non negative? Does it, this, is sparsity something that is appealing for what you're doing? Because really it's up to you, right? As the person doing it, you can, it's unsupervised learning, right? You just, do whatever you want as long as it's useful. That's why you're doing it. So decide what's useful for you and then start to build up this bag of tricks for uh, different approaches you might try. Yeah, um, slide is being a little cheeky here and basically saying, what's the disadvantage of doing this over non-negativity? Well, the disadvantage is you have to pick these hyperparameters, lambda 1 and lambda 2, but then the advantage is also you get to pick these hyperparameters, lambda 1 and lambda 2. It depends how you think about it, right? So non-negativity just gives you some amount of sparsity, uh, but you don't have this dial that we're used to having, whereas L1 regularization, if you want more sparsity, you can crank up lambda, and if you want less sparsity, you can crank down lambda, but now you have these hyperparameters to deal with. Yeah, Armand. Is there any choice of lambdas that corresponds to that? No. Is there any choice of lambdas that corresponds to the non-negative matrix factorization? So no, because if you do this with L1 regularization, you will not get non-negative values. You know what I mean? In terms of sparsity. In terms of sparsity, there must be, yeah, because the, the, the amount of sparsity should be a monotonic function of lambda. So whatever your target is, you should be able to hit that target by just tuning lambda. Yeah, but what that value is probably depends on the data set. So I can't just say, oh, lambda equals 5, and now it's the same thing. Yeah. I guess I should let you finish the question before I say no, but that's okay. Um, okay, so just to kind of summarize the things we've been talking about. Um, I hope, maybe I haven't, I think I've said this before, but okay, in case I haven't, the word sparse just means you have a bunch of zeros. So a sparse matrix means a matrix with a lot of zeros. I'm sure we talked about this with L1 regularization, but um, 
That's what sparsity means. And we now have ways of achieving sparsity. <coughs> Excuse me. So non-negativity constraints leads to sparse solutions. L1 regularization leads to sparse solutions. When we talked about feature selection for linear models, we were also kind of um, considering each feature at a time, should I keep it or not keep it? And so should I set that W to zero or not set that W to zero? And so we were also kind of making the thing sparse, but in a more direct way. And the intuition for NMF and sparse matrix factorization in particular is that if I have a lot of zeros in my Z, that means each example is now being built up out of only a few basis vectors. Because sparse Z means I have a lot of zeros in Z, meaning zero times W is happening a lot, meaning for each training example I'm only using a few things. Um, so sort of pointing towards the direction of k-means, but not all the way there, and you can have more than one non-zero thing. <coughs> and sparsity in W, um, well, maybe doesn't have as clean of an interpretation as that, um, but in cases like with the, the, the basketball or the faces, so in terms of the faces, sparsity in W means your basis vectors are just little parts of faces that you then add up together, or in terms of topic models, it means that each topic involves only a few words, or in case of the basketball, it means that each of those basketball basis vectors just had you taking shots from a small number of areas and instead of having a number assigned to everywhere on the court and then adding them and subtracting them in weird ways. Was there a question over here? Yeah, Edwin? Um, two questions. Does the sparsity in Z tends to be in the same column? And the second question is, does uh, okay, reduce... What do you mean by the same column? Same, same column meaning... It's kind of related to the second question. Okay. So, uh, does PCA, uh, does limiting the number of k's in the PCA achieve the, a similar effect as the sparse uh, matrix? Not really. Does limiting k in PCA achieve the same effect? Not really. I mean, you have fewer basis vectors, but all of them are dense. So, they all involve all the dimensions. Like in terms of the faces, you can have only a few basis vectors, but each one is still a full image. You don't have zeros there. Like with NMF, our basis vectors were just little pieces of a face, like a nose or a mouth or whatever. So, I, one thing you might be getting at is when you impose these things, like sparsity, you're taking away solutions that used to be allowed. And it's just a fact of optimization that if I don't allow things anymore, well, that can't make things better. It can only make things worse, right? So if I look at the loss, I expect the loss to be higher. I expect my reconstruction error to be higher when I start imposing all these things, non-negativity, regularization, whatever. But that's fine. And in supervised learning, when we added more regularization, we also had a higher loss. But that was also fine because we were doing it for a reason, in that case to avoid overfitting. And in here, it's kind of an interpretation issue. So why did I say that? It achieves the same effect in the sense that it makes the loss, the reconstructions worse, the, the error higher. If I reduce K in PCA, I have a higher reconstruction error, and if I make more sparsity, I also have a higher reconstruction error, but they're not the same. Um, yeah, so there's all kinds of motivations for sparsity. Um, there's a relationship here with SVMs that I guess goes beyond uh, what happens in the course, but the point is Basically, if I have zero multiplied by something, I don't have to do that multiplication. I already know it's going to be zero. So computationally, if I want to reconstruct one of these things and I have a million dimensions and only three of them are non-zero, I only have to add up those three basis vectors. So even though I'm saying it in sort of a hand wavy kind of way, computationally speaking, um, sparsity is kind of appealing and has roots in biology, neuroscience, etc. That I'm sure Fed can tell you about. Okay, so today we talked about, we did the eigenfaces thing at the beginning as sort of a lead in to non negative matrix factorization, which is one form of sparse matrix factorization, 
the other one we talked about being PCA with L1 regularization. We talked about projected gradient as a way of solving this constrained optimization problem. And that is it. So have a good weekend, and I'll see you on Monday.